And now joining our conversation, old friend Amy Holmes, anchor of the hot list on Glenn Beck's The Blaze TV. She's an independent conservative. She joins us from New York. Amy, I know you've been listening to Reed. Would you comment on his comments so far? Ah, well, I think Reid is being such a gentleman and so generous towards President Obama and that State of the Union speech. For me, it was a low point in the evolution of the State of the Union. It used to be that the president just delivered a written report to Congress, literally the State of the Union. These are our debts. This is what we owe. This is where we are. You know, basically how many chickens and cattle and eggs we have on store. Now, last night, what we had was not a State of the Union speech but a campaign speech. Uh, I don't think the president even tried to hide his intention. He announced he wasn't going to be talking about the f- next year, but rather the next five to ten as he envisions it. So, uh, if anything, politically, I think the more significant speech last night was South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley's GOP rebuttal, which Reed and I can talk about, has actually caused a lot of controversy in GOP uh, circles and what it means for the GOP primary in 2016 presidential election. Reed? I, I agree with her. Uh, <clears throat> um, Governor Haley is a friend of mine. I, I was very impressed. I continue to be impressed. I mean, her speech uh, after the uh, tragedy in her state with the, and then how she handled the Confederate flag all the way until last night. Uh, she's a class act. She's sharp. Uh, she's a chief executive. Uh, she's, a, she's a force to be reckoned with. Um, I've, I've never been clear on her ambitions, uh, but I do think last night was just yet another uh, step in her evolution well, as a, on the right, national she stage. She criticized her own party. Uh, she did, and she seemed to, and she even admitted on uh, NBC's Today Show to Matt Lauer that yes, indeed, she was attacking Donald Trump when she talked about uh, the angriest voices that are in the public square at the moment. That's exactly who she had in mind, and a lot of conservatives are criticizing her for that, which is, you know, you're supposed to be a counterpoint to the president of the United States, not the GOP frontrunner and potential GOP nominee for president of the United States. I can only imagine. I'm trying to think, like, how does this make? sense that uh, Nikki Haley, who's been talked about being a, you know, a veep on the GOP ticket, comes out and criticizes a man who might be the nominee. Maybe there's some weird Machiavellian plan at work that uh, she comes out as the moderate who can bridge the gap between the Republican base and moderate voters who may have been listening to her last night. And, and listen, I, I, I'm, I would only... Uh, <laughs> The way I view it is, I don't have a problem with it. This is the beauty. I've been out of politics for ten years. I've, I've been clean for ten years. I, I think she was. I think. <laughs> I think the way she handled it was uh, fairly honest. Uh, I think a lot of people have concerns about Donald Trump. Um, you know, towing the party line is a tough thing when someone like Donald Trump Trump is carrying the banner. Um, a lot of people have a, a wildly varying opinions on this. Um, he's, but, but here's the thing, Ray, Reed. What's interesting is that. Towing the party line is opposing Donald Trump, right? It's the establishment that is so up in arms about Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is tapping into this broad populist appeal, yes, anger, frustration, when he talks about illegal immigration, when he talks about the Islamic threat to the United States and to the world. He gets a lot of support across the political spectrum, including people who are self-identified Democrats. So if anything, it sounded like Nikki Haley last night uh, was kind of throwing her lot in with the establishment, while Donald Trump still keeps gaining support among all of these untraditional voters. So, so my, my point, Amy, and, I, and listen, I'm, I'm a big fan of Amy's, and I'm not, I, I don't usually like to de- <laughs> de- debate, but I, I will... Oh, let's but, do it. Come on, but let's I, do it. But I will say this. Um, I think, I don't like the labels of establishment and outsiders. Those are all kind of D.C. labels. I think every thoughtful person I know listens to Donald Trump and knows that he doesn't believe most of what he's saying. Most of what he's proposing isn't plausible or realistic. It's very intellectually dishonest. What do you mean? You don't think Mexico is going to pay for that wall down south? (laughs) Exactly. And so my point is, uh, I think it's intellectually dishonest that to get people all riled up, get them all riled up behind some proposals that are never going to happen. And I I think if you're a thoughtful Republican, and I'm not saying, Amy, you're not, I'm saying I think everybody... Not even a Republican. (laughs) 
Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Um, I, everybody I know uh, that's thoughtful about this process does not take Donald Trump seriously. Now, by the way, we have ourselves a real democracy now. It used to be a representative democracy where uh, where it was a different structure. Now, because of internet and social media and the environment we're in, it is a direct democracy. I don't There's care no what I don't care what anybody says. We have ourselves a real democracy, and every time someone says, uh, you know, that they wish voter turnout was high, I always say, be careful what you wish for, uh, because the masses are truly choosing the president now. Uh, wouldn't you have a problem, Amy, if if the uh, front if the nominee were Trump? You would I a, have a problem a Republican if Donald Trump? Yeah. I would have a problem if Donald Trump did not start putting some meat on those bones of his campaign slogans. He has said things that I find uh, to be completely outrageous, unsupportable, obviously thoughtless. He often backpedals when, you know, he's when this is put to his attention. He's also said strangely, weirdly, that uh, right now he's making a lot of noise and, of course, is being over the top because that's how you get attention. But should he be president, he would, you know, calm down and govern the nation with sobriety and thoughtfulness, which seems to me is that he, what he's admitting is that uh, he's being a phony, which is strange. Yeah. Uh, so I have a lot of problems with Donald but Trump. At, at I would least hope he's that he would become a more serious nominee. But I, I have to disagree with Reid here. While there's a lot to disagree with uh, Donald Trump, including Mexico building a wall, that's absurd, uh, cutting off uh, all Muslims entering the United States. That was ridiculous. However, he is addressing the issues of utmost concern to the public and to voters. So when I listened to President Obama last night, once again, banging the drum about global warming, to me, that couldn't have been more out of step, out of rhythm with what is really concerning the American people. And President Obama himself said that after the San Bernardino massacre there in California that had the whole nation in tears and upset, that he realized he didn't quite understand how upset the American people were because he didn't watch enough cable news. This is a person who's been in a bubble for eight years. His State of the Union address last night proved that. Right. If in 2008 he was a man of the moment, last night he was the man from Mars. Reed wanted to say something about the poll. Yeah, so Amy, I would love to hear, get your feedback on this. I think sure. like in 2004, I personally brought uh, some of the media up to Matthew Dowd's office, Bush's chief strategist, where he explained to them that their base assumptions in the models were all off. They were making an assumption that there was going to be fewer women, um, uh, more Hispanics. They had a lot of base assumptions. And when they reworked the model by 2 p.m. on election day, they re they changed the the polls, and people went from calling John Kerry to congratulate him to con 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 offer condolences. I think right. I think all of the the models right now the networks are using are based on the last three or four elections. I don't think this election is reflective of any past election. And I think we could find out, maybe not in the primary, but eventually in the general election, that this, ele this election is not like other elections. And I think the assumptions in these polls are, are, so could be meaning, wildly meaning off. What? Meaning that I don't think the polls are, t are giving us any accurate glimpse. Well, and we, you know, we have the wild card that is Donald Trump, and the question is that while the polls show him ahead, are those voters actually going to show up at the polling booth? The people who say they support him now, when they are in the polling booth, will they actually pull the lever? Also, we know uh, with the way that polls are conducted, it's not reflective of how people communicate anymore. That you know, the, the phone calls, so many people that that landline, they don't even have a landline, and if it's a cell phone, that that might be oversampling one group versus another. Uh, but I think most importantly. Who will be the people who go to the polling booths in November? And I'm not sure we know who they are. Uh, I agree. All right, now, why Vegas, which is not stupid, Vegas, has the Democrats two to five, whoever the Democratic nominee, two to five. That means you have to bet five dollars to win two dollars. The Republicans are three to two. You, have win, you win three dollars to bet two, yeah. meaning the Democrats are heavily favored in Vegas. So I'm still hobbling. Vegas got me uh, for the national championship. Uh, I was very confident on Bama. My kids probably won't go to college. <laughs> my, that last yeah, my time. kids probably won't go to college now. But what I will say is uh, Vegas can only crunch the numbers based on the conditions as they exist right now. And I believe that the climate whether it's you know more international instability, whether it's that it's more focused on domestic issues, the climate's going to change a lot in the, in the next year, and that's the only thing I can say to that. But Vegas is good. <laughs> so why would the and I would say Vegas is very good at taking your money, and I'm putting my money on a Powerball ticket. But Amy, why would the Democrats be so heavily favored in a pretty hip town like Vegas? You, they're not fooling you. If the hotels are telling you you got to bet five dollars, you got to bet five dollars to win two. They think the yes. Democrats are going to win. 
And yet a big Vegas billionaire, Mr. Adelson, is putting his money on Republicans, as he's we know lost, he did he's lost in the, the last, last cycle. Elections. And I'm sorry, as he did in the last cycle. So you, I guess you could say he's betting against the House. Yeah. I don't pay any attention to that. I agree with Reid. These are only the conditions as they exist now. You have a very fractured Republican Party where you have Donald Trump leading the pack, but then all of these other candidates that are battling it out. All of this is so up in the air. What does it mean? What do, what do these odds mean right now when... You know, the Democratic Party has the advantage of really only having two credible leading candidates, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. So that could be part of why uh, it looks better for them. So where where is all this? All right, predictions, Iowa. Oh, wow. I think Ted Cruz wins Iowa. He's going to have a better turnout machine. And Democrat? Um, wow, that's a toss-up. I, I, I think, I think uh, Hillary will win Iowa, though. But the last winner in Iowa was nowhere at the end. I don't think it matters, but you ask me who's going to win. <laughs> Amy, who's going to win Iowa? <laughs> I like Reed's idea of Ted Cruz with Iowa. Ted Cruz is very popular, as we know, with evangelicals. A lot of Ben Carson supporters have moved over to Ted Cruz, which is interesting since Ted Cruz was hoping to get those Trump voters when he was sticking so close to Trump through this primary process. But in fact, he's been benefiting from Ben Cruz's uh, implosion. I agree. Uh, as for Iowa, I just I wouldn't even dare say. It looks like Bernie Sanders is within striking distance, which is extraordinary when you consider that Hillary Clinton has been a household name for going on three to four decades. And Bernie Sanders, who, by the way, is a registered independent and a self-identified socialist, right. is doing so well uh, up against Hillary Clinton. She's in a lot of trouble. And don't forget, the email scandal is only widening. We are learning now that she's being investigated for potential corruption while she was Secretary right. of State and the Clinton Foundation possibly getting special favors. If something happened bad to her, like yeah. an indictment, could not Biden emerge again? Oh my gosh! If they, if I don't, Draft him at the, I, I don't see this happening. But if if something like a like formal charges that weren't going to be resolved by the election, if something like that were to happen, uh, I, I think there would be a lot of scenarios ranging from Michael Bloomberg entering the race, from Biden getting back. I think there's all sorts of scenarios you could see play out. And by the way, I, I, I meant to say this earlier. Uh, we talked about Donald Trump being a phony. At least he admi at least he admits it. Ted Cruz <laughs> doesn't admit it. <laughs> Amy, what happened? He's to a real phony, not a fake phony. Amy, what happened? To Ben Carson. What did happen to Ben Carson? He was doing so well. I think uh, that the, the attacks in Paris, the massacre there, 130 people killed by Islamic terrorists, uh, Islamic radical terrorists, I should say, then followed by San Bernardino, that GOP voters were really looking for strength in leadership, and Ben Carson failed to deliver. He failed to deliver because he didn't seem to have a grasp of Middle East politics, and frankly, he has such a soft manner, that it doesn't come across as strong and commanding. And polling data showed all through last summer that the number one attribute that GOP pr primary voters were looking for was strength and leadership, not ideological consistency, not even ideological affinity. But after eight years of President Obama floundering on the world stage, GOP voters are very hungry for someone they think can lead astride it. And unfortunately, Ben Carson didn't come across as Almost that out of time, Reed. Yeah, Ben Carson, what I was going to say is he showed up in Florida uh, for for a meeting one day, and they asked him what he thought about wet foot, dry foot, and he didn't know what it was, and that tells you everything you need to know about his candidacy. He, he, he hadn't even Googled the most important issues in right. the state I of mean, Florida. I mean, Donald Trump probably isn't that knowledgeable either, but he projects strength. <laughs> hey, thank you both very much. We'll have you on frequently in 2016.